All right, so we're going to dive into Tezos today, take a deep dive, and of course, also bring you a CEO and co-founder interview as well. My name is Paul Barron. Welcome back to TechPath. You guys know we do token analysis from time to time here, and the idea is really kind of coming from you and a lot of our audience, both in the comments and also on social media, where you guys are always looking for analysis and, hey, get this particular founder on or this CEO on to talk a little bit more about the project. So that's what we're doing today. I want to jump to Tezos um, in the sense of where the project is currently and really where it's moving, because obviously we've seen a lot of activity and movement just in the last little bit here with Ethereum and Bitcoin, and also a lot of the alt, alt projects that have really been flying over the last really five days or so. But Tezos has kind of a very interesting position in terms of its ability to, one, be a proof of stake platform, which is where Ethereum is essentially trying to move, and has already avoided these whole issues around hard forking and some of the problems and challenges that Ethereum is trying to work through to get to that scalability issue. In other words, being able to be used as a platform for whatever kind of transaction protocol you might need it in, but mainly in the ability for it to scale. I want to jump to the token, though, and look quickly at the sentiment score. We pulled this one on July the 4th. This sentiment bubble right here, which is uh, downward trend 4806, which is a little soft on sentiment. And amplification, again, was very soft, so it anticipated a little bit of the sideways action that we lined up here in the green. We did see continued movement in the downtrend here starting on July 14th, all the way down here to July 20th. But sentiment lifted a little bit here, so it started to kind of give us at least a leading indicator that also had a fairly heavy amplification improvement. Remember, if you've, this is the first time for you to understand what we're doing, uh, doing in terms of our TA, our, our technical analysis, is we use several tools out there, and I'll, and I'll jump to trade the chain here in a second to just kind of show comparison, but we look at two key indicators. One is the sentiment, which we always use as a trailing indicator, mainly to look at how sentiment was during a downtrend in a particular project. And then also at the same time, we'll look at amplification during that because it kind of removes all of the, I won't call them the fanboys, but just the general non-technical uh, aspects of investors or people that are in a project. And it really kind of gets down to the core of whether or not the project has the ability to amplify. Amplify means, again, just like stocks and any other uh, derivatives that are out there, is a lot of this stuff moves on rumor and or news same kind of scenario, so amplification has that capability. And if you look at the amplification right here on Tezos, amplification rose uh, from early July at 4105 to late July at 4903, which is a big jump. That is, even though it's eight points, that's a big jump up. Now, good amplification scores are in the range of, say, 55 to 75. So this is a softer amplification, but the fact that it was a amplification rise in Tezos itself. And of course, the, the track, we, we went ahead and pulled the amps uh, amplification radar on it. And essentially, you've got it kind of covering closely to where the actual coin tracked with exception of this little you know bubble right here. Let me get my marker. They kind of got a little bit outside, overperformed, but pretty much right here in the window all the way, it stayed and we do anticipate right now Tezos to continue a little bit of a climb here over the next few uh, couple of weeks uh, to 10 days, mainly because of their amplification. We haven't seen a long enough window here on a downtrend to pull a sentiment score to really kind of see where that continues to, to flow. And that's usually what happens is we'll pull sentiment in these little corrections that occur in a particular project. So that is something that's coming that direction. I do want to jump uh, over to trade the chain one second here and one thing that we kind of do from you know from trade to the chains aspect is we'll take a look at kind of the comparison not that our sentiment is the same but it does give us a little bit of an idea of how sentiment is flowing so here's one thing that we're going the alternate of trade the chain on this seven day so there was that bubble right here back in well, it looks to be July 27th. I want to jump back here. And you can kind of see that's this period right in here, 25, 26, 27. That's where they got a nice bump. 
The only problem is, is on trade the chain, it's not scoring the current rise, which is happening right here. And this is something that I'm finding more and more on uh, trade the chain. So I've got to keep a close eye on this because they're showing a pretty negative sentiment trend right here, even though we're bubbling out. Now, the likelihood is we'll probably see a positive sentiment uh, coming in right there on a trailer, which is where amplification comes into play back when we look at something to where we can help identify where these zones are coming in. It's not always right. It's not 100%. But what we have found is that we're getting anywhere between 60 and 80% accuracy here with these kinds of scoring methods. There's a lot of other TA analysis out there that you can get to. I'm not saying this is the only one you should look at, but it is a whole set of uh, scenarios that because the industry is so focused around sentiment and just that, you know, kind of that water cooler approach of where projects are going, rumor, news, and execution, those are the three things that all this kind of flows into. But uh, I think this is definitely one to continue to watch. We had uh, and want to get the CEO on. So joining me now is Arthur Brightman, who is one of the co-founders of Tezos. Hey, Arthur, uh, thanks so much for stopping in today. I wanna jump right into uh, some specific questions. First of all, before we get too involved in Tezos, let's learn a little bit about you, kind of your background, where did you come from, a little bit how you got into uh, becoming a, a crypto and uh, DeFi platform engineer. Sure, and thank you for having me. So uh, let's say I, I grew up in France, I studied um, mostly uh, math, uh, physics, uh, computer science. Uh, my early career worked in finance and market making. Um, I also worked a bit in robotics uh, on salary car for, uh, for Waymo. And uh, also, you know, I've had a, a, a huge interest and passion for cryptocurrencies, uh, you know, since early days. And uh, I'm the founder of Tezos. So um, Tezos is a, uh, is a protocol, uh, obviously, for, uh, for applications, smart contracts, uh, and uh, assets in the cryptocurrency. Arthur, most of the people, we've interviewed a lot of founders, and it seems like every, every one of the founders that we've talked to has been in some of these areas like what you just mentioned, obviously computer science for the most part. Interesting that you worked in the robotics side of things, especially around autonomy, because that, that's something we cover here on the show quite a bit. We've, we look at everything from Kama AI to Waymo and kind of their evolution. Obviously, we cover Tesla and what's happening over there. Um, and I want to kind of dive into why you think, and, and I guess from a general aspect, when you look at the, because we're seeing so much action in terms of uh, token projects, DeFi projects launching, and how important is it for a founder CEO like yourself to be really integrated in from an engineering and uh, programming standard? Do you think that's super important or is it something that you feel like you know, because some projects don't have that. I'm kind of just curious on your take on that. Uh, you know, I, I think it's critical. And I would say that my interest for, for cryptocurrencies is because they are such a um, interdisciplinary field. And I had a strong interest in many of the disciplines involved. And so obviously there's a uh, math component with the cryptography. Um, there's a finance component. It's, you know, it's, it's especially true. It's, it's true for cryptocurrencies. It's especially true for DeFi, where yeah. um, you are building financial primitives and knowledge of uh, quantity finance it's hugely important here uh, and an aspect in computer science. And on top of that, it's also, I would say, uh, a political and ideological component uh, uh, to it. And I was at the intersection of, of, of all of this. And so um, I, I completely fell down that, 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 that rabbit hole. So ultimately, you know, um, these, it's easy to forget that a lot of these projects are ultimately software projects. And so having a culture of software engineering, of computer science um, is, right. I think, fundamental for, uh, for any project which is going to have some state power. Let's talk about the idea for launching Tezos, because uh, obviously there's a, a tremendous amount of variations out there in terms of the DeFi protocols, but what was one of the key things that was like the driver to say, hey, we see this problem, we think we have a solution, here's where we're going to go with the, concept, uh, the conception of Tezos itself. Yeah, the main driver was essentially governance. And uh, in the early days of Bitcoin, um, I, you know, I was fascinated by Bitcoin and um, I was especially fascinated with all of the research that was emerging around it. Um, alternative versions of consensus, ways to have better privacy on the chain. Uh, and at the time, and I would say around maybe 2011, 2012, it was uh, widely discussed in the, in the Bitcoin community. And people would say, you know, um, at the end of the day, 
Bitcoin is only a set of entries in a ledger. Um, there's a software underneath, but the software is just a way to maintain it and it can be swapped out so long as we remain the, we, we keep the entries. Um, and that kind of uh, glosses over the question of like, well, you know, how do you swap it out? Who swaps it out? How do you agree mm -hmm. on this? Um, and there's an approach to that, uh, which comes from the open source world called fork based governance. The idea is that, you know, developers can develop new versions and people can run whichever version they want. And that doesn't really work when you have a very strong network effect. When you have a network effect, you can't just use whatever software you want. You want to be using the software that everyone else uses. And I think that introduced the need for a formal governance process. And the idea of Tezos was to build a cryptocurrency and smart contract platform, which had formal governance at its core, um, a means for the users of the platform to decide on how it should evolve, because there was just so much evolution and so much discovery um, in the field and still, and, and it still is today. Yeah, I, you know, we, we see and get from our readers, audience, viewers, listeners across all of the, the network itself, a lot of people who compare Tezos in some way to that of Ethereum, even though it has such a uniqueness that is quite considerably different. Explain kind of the variation, but yet kind of the unique elements that kind of, why people kind of get lost in those comparisons. What is it about Tezos and Ethereum that have uh, such similarities? Yes, and first, I think the comparison is fair because ultimately they do have a lot in common. So they're both um, built on a decentralized blockchain. They are both, you know, uh, powered by a cryptocurrency. They both have smart contracts. So, you know, many points of, uh, of comparison. I would say I would highlight three differences. Uh, one is that uh, Ethereum is a proof of work platform. So it relies on mining in order to secure itself, um, meaning that um, it creates new tokens at every block, which gets paid to people who spend energy. Uh, in exchange for, for the tokens. Uh, Tezos is a proof of stake platform and has always been. Now, I know that there's some interest on the Ethereum side in moving to proof of stake, but it's something that has yet to happen. Uh, another aspect is the smart contract languages. Ethereum builds on a very low level language, so it's kind of an assembly language, almost machine code, and you rely on um, high level languages to compile to it. Tezos uses a different approach. We use a higher level virtual machine. Now in practice, what it means is that if you're developing an application on Tezos, you have access to better tooling for ensuring that your application does what it's supposed to do. You have better tools for checking the correctness of your code, which I think is important for high value financial application. It, um, it's a subtle difference, but I think it's, it can make a world of difference when building a, uh, an application. And the third one, of course, which uh, we touched upon is governance. So uh, Ethereum is based on fork-based governance. The idea being that once in a while, there's going to be a new version of Ethereum. And in theory, you have a choice with running the old version and be alone or run the new version like everybody else. And in Tezos, we uh, use instead formal governance where any change to the protocol needs to be approved by a vote on the chain itself. Um, so uh, it, and it's, it's, it's a pretty rigorous vote. It's a three month process you require an 80% supermajority. So it's not, you know, it doesn't change willy nilly, but we have a formal process for enacting changes in the protocol. How much, so how much evolution and change? Obviously we're talking a little bit about Ethereum and what ETH 2.0 and even the London hard fork, which is coming up this, this very week uh, and kind of the variations that uh, have evolved in both the, you know, the blockchain ecosystems since back when Ethereum, you guys of course started in 2014. If you look back and, and kind of see the evolution of where Tezos has come from, are there any things that you would do a little differently or do you guys feel like you've been able to kind of create a model that has been able to hold kind of the test of time? What are your thoughts on, on I mean, looking at it for the future? I mean, you know, if I didn't do anything dis differently, it means I'm not learning at all, which would be a very, <laughs> a very bad sign. So with hindsight, Obviously, I would do, a, you know, there's a ton of like design tweaks that I would do. I would, uh, but the nice thing is, and, and the reason for governance is that um, you don't need to come up with a perfect design from the get go. If you, uh, if you have a governance model that lets you upgrade your protocol, you can iterate, you can uh, right. progressively get it better and better. And that's what we've been doing. Um, in fact, uh, Granada, which is the um, uh, seventh uh, upgrade to the, uh, to the chain is actually activating in a couple of days. Um, and there's been an upgrade recently of, of about every three months. So we're gradually getting there and progressively getting better as opposed to trying to intuit on day one, the perfect protocol. Yeah. Arthur, there's a lot of movement in the DeFi space. Uh, we're seeing more and more companies that are in traditional finance or centralized finance that are 
one, started to either uh, look into that space much more efficiently or they're actually participating. Companies like Square, which has already jumped up, PayPal with their new super wallet. You know, we see all these activities. Kind of curious what your thoughts are, where the market is going, how long do you think we're going to see uh, DeFi before DeFi really starts to really interconnect with modern day centralized finance? Kind of curious on, on where that might go. I think there's fascinating stuff going on in DeFi uh, and a lot of financial innovation. And, you know, I see a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of you know, brilliant minds in quantity finance start taking an interest into DeFi and building those primitives. Um, and so that's that's super exciting. I don't think that right now DeFi is being used for very interesting purposes. I think it's all extremely circular, but you can think of this as a, as a, as a test ground for more uh, important and more useful applications down the line. So I think the primitives that are being built, such as um, you know um, uh, smart contract based market makers, uh, subsidized, uh, subsidies of liquidity through, uh, uh, through these contracts, uh, synthetic products, all of that is fascinating and super interesting. Uh, right now it's being put in the service of like a, uh, you know, uh, gambling essentially, but they yeah. are really good applications, which I don't think we've seen quite yet, but which are coming. It, from the evolution of where Tezos is going, uh, if you look at your roadmap over the next few years, is there anything you're really looking forward to in terms of the development of Tezos? Absolutely. So, you know, I, I, I often like to, to, to mention that I, I might have a roadmap in my head for, uh, for where I'd like Tezos to, to go. But at the end of the day, the roadmap is in the hand of the, the validators of the network because they choose how the network evolves. Uh, but, you know, on my side, I'm, I'm quite excited um, to start seeing rollups uh, in the Tezos ecosystem. Now, rollups are something you see on other chains. But the difference is that we are building first class support for rollups in the protocol, which means that um, it will have an you will have an easier UX around rollups. It will be easier to deploy them. So, um, making them really feel at home and comfortable on a Tezos network. That's one thing. Uh, and in general, I'm also super excited for the things which are not on my roadmap. So, anything that other people might propose, which will be exciting and new uses of uh, of Tezos in the protocol. I like that in the sense of you know kind of the evolution of where some of these coins and tokens are going. Just the projects in general. Explain to me a little bit about uh, how the Tezos blockchain, TZBTC, meaning Bitcoin, yeah. on, on the Tezos blockchain. Ex explain that, how it works. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it, it, it's fairly straightforward. Uh, and, you know, uh, many blockchains have uh, a wrapped version of Bitcoin. So, for example, uh, on the Ethereum chain, wrapped BTC, WBTC has been very popular. Also, um, WBTC depends on a single custodian, which is Bitco. And um, TZBTC relies on a consortium of five different custodians. But fundamentally, it's the same. Uh, it's essentially the same model. You go to the custodian, you deposit Bitcoin, and they will mint for you a, uh, uh, a tokenized representation of it, and, and you can redeem it. So it's you know there's no um, there's nothing very very fancy here uh, aside from the fact that it's a little nicer to depend on a consortium uh, of a multi-signature rather than on, on a single custodian. Yeah. How, so how big is the ecosystem right now? What does uh, the overall ecosystem look like today? Well, the nice thing about uh, a decentralized ecosystem, or, or, or the not nice thing, I don't know, is that you can't really know its size. Uh, I, I, I do interact with, I think, many actors of the ecosystem, uh, but not all of them. And you know, some, you know, I, sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll open Twitter in the morning and I'll see new projects you know, being released on Tezos. And I don't know anything about them, or I don't know anything about the people creating them. So I don't have a uh, I don't have a good view. But I do know that if you're looking at uh, infrastructure like raw infrastructure, meaning like libraries, uh, core yeah. development, this type of this type of nuts and bolts, I would say there's probably a few hundred people working on on uh, on this full time in the world today in uh, in a variety of uh, of uh, of companies and projects. And the projects themselves, like I said, it's hard to know because there's you know new projects launching every day. Yeah, we've, we've picked up several uh, that have continued to develop, I guess, and you know, we're finding more and more, uh, I guess, protocols that are in that kind of that space. Just the expansion of blockchain in general is moving at such a, a liquid pace. It's very difficult to kind of keep track of all those developers that are really going out with an open source project like what we've seen. When you look at the challenges facing uh, all of the blockchain development, DeFi, cryptocurrency in general, um, obviously here in the United States, we're seeing some pretty active involvement right now as we speak around legislation. There's been several, actually one bill that just was uh, brought up today 
What are your thoughts about legislation? Do you feel like regulation and, and that is just a, a coming thing that needs to happen? Where, where is your position? Well, my position is that there's already, you know, there already is regulation and uh, historically financial regulation has focused on intermediaries and, you know, for uh, a quite understandable reason, uh, if you take people's money and you hold it and you say, I'm going to do something with your money, uh, right. then there's a regulation to make sure like people are not going to run away with the money or that they actually say, you know, they actually do what they say they're going to do. Um, you know, so for example, if you're a money transmitter and people send you money and you say, sure, send me money, I'll send it to your aunt in Ohio. Um, you have to want to make sure that the people actually do this and don't run away with it. So, and historically, all of these um, legislations have applied consistently to um, to crypto. So it, it, it's not it's not true to say that it's unregulated. It's actually quite regulated. What's more worrying is that we're now seeing uh, attempts at legislation, which instead of focusing on this, are saying, "Well, wait a second. If you have any involvement, even a tangential involvement, like maybe you're a developer, you're working on some project, then somehow." We're going to hold you um, to the same status as someone who actually, you know, takes funds from people and and, right. run away. and so it's it's very weird because it creates you know it creates regulations that you can't even comply with in principle. You know, even if you wanted to, because it just there's a big dependence mismatch. And I think part of it is um, I would say a lack of education and understanding of what the industry is, because a lot of people think of it right. in terms of traditional framework and they imagine that. You know, oh, surely there has to be a custodian. Surely someone is like holding the funds, which is not necessarily true. And so, uh, what I'm hoping for is that you know, if there is uh, if there is to be financial regulation, it takes the form that financial regulation has historically taken, which is to focus on financial intermediaries and not on uh, people innovating, creating new software, creating um, new concepts. Because you really don't know where it uh, where it stops. Well, if you write a scientific paper and the scientific paper contain some ideas about uh, financial primitives. All of a sudden, someone are using these primitives. You know, are you are you somehow responsible for these people? It's it's very it's it's a very dangerous slope, and I don't see how it's compatible, uh, especially in the U.S. with the First Amendment. Yeah, I think that's the key with a, a lot of these governing bodies is that some of them have at least a, a, a bit of understanding around blockchain, but the intricacies of it are really challenging, I think, from a lawmaker's standpoint of them tr really one understanding as it is today and the fast evolution of it as it changes and morphs and as the ecosystem itself starts to kind of fill in the, the gaps of where there's problems in the industry, whether it's in the finance space or many other areas. We see a lot around mm -hmm. carbon credits and things of that around uh, the ECG side or ESG side of things, which I think is going to be a big part of this. And of course, you guys going with the proof of stake model, you kind of have already solved at least that uh, scenario where sustainability and eco-friendly yeah. uh, projects are, are out there. Can you talk more about, was that an intentional model for Tezos or was this something that was just adopted due to certain you know, concepts in the roadmap? I wouldn't say that energy consumption was the uh, was the overriding focus. I think the focus was actually on um, inflation, and the idea is that we, proof of stake is actually much cheaper than proof of work. You yeah. can buy a comparable amount of security uh, with a lot less expensive. So when you know sometimes proof of work people push back and saying like no proof of work is not wasteful. You know it doesn't waste anything because you use it to secure um, the ledger, and that's fair. But if there exists a way. Um, a compar you know, comparable way of securing a ledger, which is orders of magnitude cheaper, then yes, it is wasteful to use the most, uh, the more expensive one. Now that being said, to be completely fair, the security properties of proof of work and proof of stake are subtly different. And it's true that there's some subtle properties of proof of work you cannot replicate with proof of stake. And there are some not subtle properties of proof of stake that you cannot replicate with proof of work. So if you look at the balance of the two, um, it massively favors proof of stake and almost every single protocol launching today is launching in mm -hmm. proof of stake. So. Proof of work is really legacy, and um, now that being said, you know it turns out um, it, it, so it's cheaper. And if you also believe that somehow energy is mispriced because it doesn't price the cost of externalities associated with production, then it's doubly cheaper. Um, but that's right. a, you know, that, that's a separate concern. Yeah. So Andrew, when you look at um, or Arthur, when you look at kind of the the challenges that we are facing now. Obviously, the regulatory side of things is is somewhat being attacked, and or approached upon. How is what what would you say the climate is for cryptocurrency and the blockchain technology in Europe right now? You're there in Europe. You've you've seen kind of what the EU is trying to do. What does the overall framework look like there? Is it as active as what we're seeing here in the U.S.? 
I would look honestly. I would say I'm not an expert here, and I, you know, I, I, get, I get my information from reading out um, some of the work that Coin Center is putting out, for, uh, for instance, and they do comments on, um, you know, the FATF guidance, for, for example, right. and uh, the latest language in the infrastructure bill. So, I'm not. I, I, I don't have this. Uh, I don't have any uh, uh, superior or like inside knowledge in this that they that they wouldn't have. But uh, I would say it goes back to my point. You, you, you see this idea of saying, oh, wait a second. Even if you're a software developer and you're writing software, somehow we might treat you as someone who's uh, holding customer funds, which is very, um, which is a very weird and dangerous step. Yeah, yeah, for sure. All right. Well, I, I, one thing is is that we have a lot of audience that are really uh, into Tezos as the project uh, in terms of the protocol. So that's the good thing. They always are always at. This is one of those uh, projects that we get a lot of interest in. So it's been great having you on today. Thank you so much for stopping in. We appreciate you uh, your time. Thank you so much for having me. Have a good one. All right, Arthur Brightman there, of course, with Tezos. If you guys are listening in over on the podcast right now, make sure and stay tuned. And also give us some stars. That's the one way we can kind of learn what you're looking for. If you're here on YouTube, the number one thing you can do, of course, is subscribe. Make sure and like this video. If you don't like the content of what we're presenting, you know, give us a note or maybe just don't dislike something just because maybe you don't like the topic. Maybe you're an investor in something else. But uh, we, we love to get your feedback and comments below, so make sure and hit those there. Of course, you can always hit me up on Twitter, which is just at Paul Barron. We'll catch you next time right here on TechPath. Thank <laughs> you.